company town In a company town Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Fighting for Civil Rights at Sparrows Point. I'm Jacob Lynch. I'm a librarian with uh, the Baltimore County Public Library. This program was developed as a partnership um, between the library and the Baltimore Museum of Industry um, and is offered in support of Voices and Votes, Democracy in America, part of Museum on Main Street, a collaboration between the Smithsonian Institute, Maryland Humanities, and the Historical Society of Baltimore County. Um, there's currently a display at CCBC Dundalk and the Historical Society of Baltimore County, as well as some uh, smaller displays at several um, BCPL locations, including the North Point branch in Dundalk, where this program was supposed to be held in person today, but, but unfortunately we had to move it um, virtually. I wanted to thank the uh, Baltimore Museum of Industry and Ani in particular, who really did all the work on this program and um, set up the Zoom webinar. We were originally um, uh, the BMI was going to live stream it, the in-person program here at North Point. Um, so it's very easy to transition to virtual because she already had everything set up. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Beth Maloney because nobody wants to listen to me talk anymore, I'm sure. And um, <laughs> I hope everyone enjoys today. Thank you, Jake. Um, my name is Beth Maloney. I work with Ani Gellis, who's also here behind the scenes. I'm the Director of Interpretation at the Baltimore Museum of Industry, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to today's program on the fight for civil rights at Sparrows Point. For those not familiar with the museum, we're located on the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We're dedicated to telling the stories of the workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. We just wrapped up the third year of our Bethlehem Steel Legacy Project, which seeks to preserve the 125 year history of the steel making giant in Baltimore. As part of this project, we installed a long-term exhibition, Fire and Shadow, the Rise and Fall of Bethlehem Steel in the museum galleries. And I hope you'll consider coming to the museum, checking that out if you haven't already. Another part of this project is the award-winning podcast, Sparrows Point, an American Steel Story, produced by Aaron Hankin of WIPR. It's available on our website and anywhere you get your podcasts. And you'll be hearing some excerpts from this podcast today. And now just a reminder that programs like this are made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you're currently a supporter, thank you. And if you'd like to find out more about becoming a member, I encourage you to visit our website at thebmi.org. Your support helps ensure that we can continue to engage people in important conversations like the one we're looking forward to this afternoon. Um, I have a little bit of housekeeping to remind you about. Uh, your cameras and your mics are turned off but we encourage you to participate by asking a question using the chat. We'll be monitoring that throughout the program. This program is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. We anticipate the program will be about 90 minutes long. I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Deborah Rudisill. Deborah is a science journalist and the author of three books, including Roots of Steel, boom and bust in an American mill town. Since 2012, she's been professor of the practice of journalism at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, that's UMBC. Before I turn it over to Deborah, we'll listen to some excerpts from the podcast, Sparrow's Point, an American Steel Story to help lay the groundwork for our discussion. So take a few minutes to listen, look for a link in the transcript in the chat. Um, thank you, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back to Sparrow's Point, an American Steel Story. I'm Aaron Henkin, and this episode, we're going to get into three overlapping stories, labor unions, race relations, and civil rights at Bethlehem Steel. 
Now, you might remember near the end of our last episode, we learned that Sparrows Point's steelworkers unionized in 1941, right on the eve of World War II. But let's zoom out for a minute and look at the fact that this mill had already been up and running for about 50 years before that. And let's remember, too, that this is a plant that was designed with a very intentional company town built around it. And that company town was built with the goal, really, of controlling the workforce by providing everything from housing to schools to a company store. And that town was racially segregated by design, as were the jobs at the mill. The whole scenario was also designed to keep labor unions out of the picture. So what happened 50 years later to throw open Sparrows Point's doors to a unionized workforce? And what happened in the decades after that to desegregate the jobs in the mill? We're going to answer those questions in this episode, but first I want to introduce you to Mike Lewis. These days, Mr. Lewis works with the United Steelworkers International Union. I interviewed him over the phone from his office in Hampton, Virginia. Mr. Lewis worked at Sparrows Point for 33 years. He started in 1979. He was 18 years old at the time, just out of high school. I was hired, and uh, on my first day, I was. they told me I was going to be reporting to the 10 mill. They took us over for a tour, introduced us to... Uh, the supervision within the 10 mill kind of explained a little bit about what we would be doing and uh, signed us locker rooms, gave us uh, our, our hard hats and steel toe work shoes and safety glasses and all that good stuff and uh, told us how we would be scheduled and everything. And I remember it like it was yesterday. It was about seven of us that day that started at the same time. Mr. Lewis will tell you when you were a steel worker, it was a commitment to an entire way of life. And what I mean by that was you worked at Sparrows Point. You know, you knew you were going to have to work in conditions that were dirty at times, hot at times, cold at times. You know, you had to deal with uh, certain workplace hazards. Uh, you had to always deal with uh, layoffs because the steel industry was a, a cyclical business. And you almost accepted it. And to your fellow steelworkers that you worked with, the people who depended on you for their safety and you depended on for your own safety, it was a type of camaraderie uh, that it, it's almost hard to explain if you've never experienced it. Uh, we just worked at the point. And if you had a job at the point and you worked at the point, you were part of that point family. Being part of that family also meant being part of the union, paying dues and going to meetings on Dundalk Avenue. We always knew that we were represented. In fact, I think some of us took some of the benefits and wages that uh, we had for granted. Uh, and they didn't, I didn't really fully understand uh, what all it took to garner uh, a lot of the things that we took for granted, like uh, the what people would call today the Cadillac health health care plan, uh, you know, progressive pay increases, time and a half for overtime, the paid holidays, you know, uh, the subpay if you were on a layoff period, the supplemental unemployment benefit along with the regular unemployment benefit, all things that came out of hard-fought negotiations that if you have never involve yourself in the process, you think they are just a given. Mr. Lewis says back in the day when he was growing up, his grandfather was a big influence on him. He was a longshoreman who initially had worked at Sparrows Point when he first arrived in Baltimore. He was a very strong African-American figure in my life. And he always told me that all things being equal, you're going to finish second. He said, so that's just the way it is. So you don't have to like it. I don't like it. But you're going to always have to be better and work a little harder. And, be a, and, and show people that, you, you know, you can excel at certain things at every level. Okay, and this man didn't go much further than the fourth grade in school, but he was very smart. And it wasn't until I became older and got in, into the workplace that I saw some things. I saw favoritism. I saw uh, not openly overt racism, but, you know, covert racism and cronyism and stuff like that. Uh, so you just had one, that was one of the things that 
I struggled with, that I felt like people were getting opportunities. And, uh, you know, maybe they weren't the best person for the job, but they knew the right person. Over time, Mr. Lewis got more involved in his local union. He joined some committees, and he decided to run for the position of shop steward. And he knew he had an uphill battle because, like he says, all things being equal, he probably would finish second. And that's just a reality of life. You know, I don't like it. Uh, it's the history of this country. But I believe that uh, if, I, if I applied myself and if I did my best and I genuinely performed the function of being a steward or a rep or a trainer, a uh, union-based safety trainer, working hard on the committee, and doing my best to make a difference, the people would recognize that, and over time they did. To Mr. Lewis, the unions came to mean everything. He says they were a crucial instrument for garnering civil rights for African-American workers. One of the key covenants of the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King was that uh, organized labor helped raise up working class people, black and white uh, alike, you know, and collectively working together, you can get more than engaging in rampant individualism. Mr. Lewis will tell you his involvement with the union really matured him and shaped him as a person. He came to appreciate that unions were there to help him and his fellow workers bargain and fight as a collective body. And without them, they wouldn't have so many of the things they took for granted. It was a connecting of the dots, so to speak, in which you say, well, I, I enjoy this wage benefit that provides me with a middle-class lifestyle. I don't have to worry about anything if I get sick because I have health insurance. You know, uh, I don't think that the company just said, you know, Mike, uh, I think you deserve a few weeks off you know, and I'll pay you for it and consider this your vacation. I think somebody fought for that. And when you're younger, those aren't the those aren't the primary things you focus on. You just say, Hey man, I got insurance on this job. You know, I'm a g i am get I make this just for working here and you don't understand the backstory of all of that. It it is the union and it is organized labor that made that possible. And when you become aware of that, Mr Lewis says you have two choices. You can keep taking it for granted or you can do everything you can to try to preserve and enhance that union. When it came to union participation, Mr. Lewis says, you're either part of the solution or part of the problem. And he made a conscious decision to become part of the solution. In the locker room, you heard people talking. This is Lonnie Vick. We met him back in the first episode of this podcast. I'm going to call my shop steward. I'm going to call the union president, right? And they would arrive on the scene, and you and you could hear some of the discussion. Mr. Vick was a welder in the Marine Division at Sparrows Point. He was a member of the Industrial Union of Marine Shipbuilding Workers of America. See, the union would go and, 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 and deal with management, right? So I knew that, hey, this is something that I need to be a part of. If I'm going to be in the workforce, I need to be a participating member of the organization that their only duty is to protect me, protect my livelihood, and to help me increase my earning capacity. That is the, the function of a union. In 1970, when Mr. Vick started work at Sparrows Point, the work bathrooms in the plant still had the old segregation era signs on them that said white and colored. He said the bathrooms were actually desegregated at the time. Those old signs were just a vestige. But segregation was most definitely still looming large when it came to job opportunities. After when I became uh, the shop steward, one of my uh, goals was to help the other individuals, particularly the minorities, uh, to get upgraded from being third class to second class and to eventually to become first class. Because I could see that uh, the minority was being not given the same opportunities for promotion. When you get to talking to Mr. Vick about the kind of racism that he was dealing with in the 1970s, he'll tell you it was a subtle racism. And he says it wasn't your fellow workers so much who was discriminating against you. It was the invisible hand of the corporation. When you go into one of those tanks to work, you know, 
and you're working alongside no matter whether it's a, uh, what race they may be, no matter what sex they may be, no matter what sexual orientation it may be, your safety and your well-being depends on them as well as their safety and well-being depended on you. So you kind of develop a uh, camaraderie ship among the employees because we all was being treated at at that time with you know with certain disdain because this this was a multinational corporation right they didn't have no more feeling for the my white counterpart there as they did for me and a lot of them understood that a lot of them understood that now that's not to say that that wasn't racism of course there were but what you, what you have to consider is that what was taking place, it was kind of a, a subtle racism, too, in the 1970s, right? It was your job assignment. What kind of job assignment were you getting versus your white counterparts of equal qualification? Because at that time, we were working on incentives. You know, the more you did, the more you got paid. And certain jobs, you could do much quicker, you can do much easier, they were much cleaner, or they're much dirtier, either way. And so now that's what you really had to keep your eye on, or to look, as always, the comparison standard there. What was they getting versus what you was getting? All right, we're going to rewind now from Mr. Vick's era, the 1970s, all the way back to the early days of Sparrows Point in the late 1800s. And we're going to turn again to our historian, Mark Reuter, the author of Making Steel. When Mr. Reuter was researching his book, he found an archival essay that the original manager of the blast furnace at Sparrows Point had written for the British Iron and Steel Association. And this essay was a cold, calculating evaluation of the different types of ethnic groups that were employed at Sparrows Point. He, he did it in a very clinical fashion, like he was discussing the processes that make steel. And this is what he said. He said that the most loyal and anti-union and family-loving worker that they wanted wor- working at Sparrows Point were the Pennsylvania Dutch. They were, they were uh, instinctively against unions, and um, they were the ones that they favored. The essay went on to praise the Irish and English workers as well, and then it got around to talking about the black workers at Sparrows Point, who were living in the segregated housing on the other side of Humphreys Creek. Well, this essay um, was very explicit. Then Pennsylvania Steel didn't want black people, black men from Baltimore. They wanted black country boys. They wanted country boys who would work in the labor gangs, which were essentially no different than the hard labor of a sharecropper. Most of the labor gangs, there were huge numbers of them, would just take picks and and spikes and rebuild railroad tracks, transfer that, do heavy labor, clean out the blast furnaces once or twice a year when they needed to be cleaned out and were steaming hot. So that became the rule from early on, black workers on the heaviest, dirtiest, and hottest jobs. And when Bethlehem Steel took over Sparrows Point in 1916, they followed this rule, but they took it even a step further. There were recruiting drives in um, North Carolina, in Virginia, in South Carolina to get black country boys to come to Sparrows Point. And when they came to Sparrows Point, there was a really cruel rule. That, that went on. And it was the segregation of Maryland and Baltimore writ in a steel mill. And this was what it was. A black worker who came to Sparrows Point joined the labor gangs. Under the rules that the union in the 40s and into the 50s and 60s adhered to, you could not transfer from your unit without losing all seniority. Therefore, by funneling blacks into the labor crews early on when they're 18, 19 years old, by the time these guys are 30 and 40, they're going to stay in the labor gangs, which again had the lowest wages at the point.
Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this program. Um, I'm very excited to be here with all of you, um, and I'm really excited to hear um, our panelists continue um, sharing information about the civil rights struggle at Sparrows Point, uh, which you just heard a little bit of a, a prequel uh, to from um, Aaron Henkin's wonderful podcast. Um, just a, a brief introduction. Um, uh, as Ani said earlier, uh, I uh, wrote and published a book called Roots of Steel, Boom and Bust and an American Mill Town, which was published in 2010. I grew up in Dundalk myself, um, and, but I have to say, I really didn't know very much at all about uh, the history of the civil rights struggle on Sparrows Point until I began uh, reporting and researching uh, that book. Um, and it became clear to me very early on in that process that there were two parallel strands of this narrative of the history of Sparrows Point. Um, there was the white steelworker story and there was the black steelworker story. And although there were certainly lots of similarities and lots of parallels, there were also some very significant differences. So um, I really worked hard to uh, reach out in the community so that I could be sure to uh, fairly cover uh, both of those stories. And of course, the stories of the women are another strand, but we won't talk about that today. Um, so I'd like to begin by um, asking Eddie Barty Jr., uh, three generations of whose family lived and worked on Sparrows Point, to talk a little bit about the contributions of Black steelworkers and Black union organizers and members over the more than 100 year history of the works. Um, I know, Eddie, you were a little critical of the original broadcast because you thought it focused too much on the civil rights struggle and not enough about the contributions of, of Black steelworkers. So maybe you could share a little of your own family story also and how it reflects those, those contributions. Sure, Deb. Um, when, you, when you first came out early on, you asked a few questions about what did the Blacks do to try to bring things together. One of the things we had, we had a joint civil rights committee which included all five locals at that particular time. And it included the guy from labor relations that we sit down and we talked about the issues that were going on in the plant. Some of the issues that was going on in the plant was the harm practices. We talked about affirmative actions. The harm practices and affirmative actions, we came together as a conclusion to say at this point, uh, how do we reach out? How do we reach out to be able to, in the metropolitan area, to hire more Black employees at Beth Steel? Of course, we went to, at that particular time, it was uh, Silas Point. Uh, it was a vocational school. You had Essex, you had Carver, you had vocational schools. So we wanted to attract people to come to the point to try to have a better standard of living. So we reached out to those schools just to see if we could get applicants to come to Beth Steel. We also had, as time moved forward, when we went down to one local, we had a group of people that was called the Rainbow Coalition that came from all over the point. Most of them were black and females. And we joined together at the NAACP to have meetings to discuss the issues that were going on within the plant. And some of the issues still standing right there was the harm practices. When you looked, you'll find out that that particular time moving forward that they claim a lot of people couldn't pass the drug test, test and different things that was going on. So the ratio was really bad towards Blacks being hard in the plant, male and female. It even got worse when it came down to, in one of the contracts, they put, we would consider your family members for employment. At that particular time, I was the chairman of civil rights and I was getting phone calls from different people, specifically black people, was saying, e even uh, one of the persons who was on my committee got a phone call when our son called, they hung the phone up. I had several people tell me when their son called, they hung the phone up. But I can watch and see that I had 
coworkers, family members that were white, that were being hard. Oh, my son got a job. Oh, my son got a job. My son got a job. So at that particular time, I went to the union floor. And, um, and, I, and I announced as the Civil Rights Committee that if you felt as though one of your family members was being denied because of their voice, which is always heavier than white folks' voice, and they got hung up on, just let me know, and I could try to follow through with the employment office, and I had to back in on the president at that particular time. So these are the type of things that were going on even through up until the last point of hiring at uh, different companies. I mean, you know, we went through from Bethlehem Steel to ISG, the Middle Steel, the Service Star, and so forth. So no matter what, these things stayed in practice because the practice was, was just there that um, they hand-selected who they wanted to be in the plant. And some of that stuff had a burn of the union. The union was separated still between the steel side and the, and the finishing side. And it seemed like a lot of the finishing side people were getting their people with a job. And some of the steel side people weren't able to get their people a job at the plant. So those are the, some, some of the things that you were confronted with to the challenge within the union and the company and labor relations. We talk about civil rights. We talk about what, what I think about civil rights, okay? Uh, between the two obstacles I told you, the vehicles that we try to use to make things better, I give you some situations of like in the steel making. In steel making, we had a black gentleman who was 57 years old. He had 38 years at the plant. There was a white gentleman that had two years that was leapfrogging over him for one of the highest positions training. When he asked consistently to be trained for this position, he had the seniority and he had the capability. They were behind the back training a junior white employee. So when it was brought to my attention, brought to labor labor's retention, we went and sit down and talk to the superintendent the zone personnel for the union, the employee, the senior foreman, the superintendent, labor relations, and myself and my committee. Everybody, when we walked in there, the first thing that happened was the turn foreman, the senior turn foreman, start the line. And the black employee was being denied at the job. I, I really don't want to call names. And the reason why I don't want to call names is because some people might be passed away or different things. So I just always use black employee versus white employee. So the, the black employee immediately, once the guy started lying and saying this wasn't happening, he immediately took a hard hat and just threw it. And, and this is the first time I've ever been in a meeting that turned out to be this hostile. So the zone man took him to another room to calm him down. In the meantime, I looked directly at the superintendent. And I'm quite sure people may and may not understand what postal is. You know, at the time that the postal person at the post office came back and shot up the people in the post office because of the fact of how he was being treated. I immediately reflected to the superintendent of labor relations. I said, you know what? You setting this up for a postal. You see exactly how this is going down. I said, we got to do something. We got to do something like right now. And as a result of that, and I'm not trying to take a lot of time, but as a result of that, the result of that became this guy was immediately trained, was immediately compensated for the time that he should have been trained. And this guy got over $50,000 $50, in, in, in the reward of, of grievances. So this is the type of stuff that what took places during my time. I have about five or six scenarios here on paper to tell you from the steel side to the tin mill to the cold sheet mill. I worked in the cold sheet mill. Lenny Shadell worked in the cold sheet mill. Mike Lewis worked in the cold sheet mill. The cold sheet mill was called Little Mississippi. They put that label on the wall. They painted it on the wall. When I used to go past there, when I first got hard there, I really didn't really understand exactly what it meant exactly, but, but I did see what it came down to. I tell you, there was five guys in the old, old, old sheet coal mill that wore a white hat. They were black guys. 
They could never get their name on the hat to become company men. There were other guys that was working in lines to become term foreman that actually got their name on the hat, which were white employees. So even as this involved, as we came up with a new coal mill, these guys went to Austria to learn how to commission the mill. The black guys and the rest and everybody else, including myself and the rest of the guys. Long story short, when it came out to promotion again, these guys had prior experiences of being turn foremans. These guys had product, a product experiences to the point where they could run turns, do everything necessary. They went to the training. They did a intro net for a guy to sign. They didn't put it on the internet, but they put it on the intro net. And they had a white guy that they moved up to train to be a foreman over top of all the guys that had experience. I think a lot of our listeners, um, Eddie, would be shocked to hear that these sorts of practices were still going on in the late 20th and even the early 21st century, because I think many people kind of assume that after the consent decrees in the 1970s and, um, you know, with society changing, that a lot of these these practices would have would have died out. So it's it's shocking to hear, and some of these stories are new even to me, that even after the Beth Steele bankruptcy and the changes of ownership, there were still these sorts of um, discriminatory practices were common. Oh, that was common because even in the new coal mill, we had a foreman. This particular foreman was a foreman that came in early and he was looking for a guy that was on term, which was a black guy. and. He called him on the radio and he called him on the phone. He didn't ask. He went to the shanty. He went to the shanty. He was in there. So the next morning, he went by the assistant superintendent's office. And he just so happened to say at this particular time, he used the N-word. He said, I should have fought the N-word. I should have fought the N-word. Okay. And just so happened, our zone man walked by and he heard this. His name, the zone man at the time, he heard it and he immediately called me and I called labor relations superintendent and this particular foreman. This particular foreman also had a history. If you, if you watch the practice, the way he practiced, in the beginning, all the maintenance guys in electrical had to come to a morning meeting to be assigned their jobs. The black employees definitely had to be ready with their Hearts, heart, their uniforms on, hard hats on, and steel toes. The white em employees came there eating their breakfast, not dressed, ready to go to work, and nothing was said. We had a meeting with the superintendent about the practices of, of this particular foreman. When we had that meeting, exactly how he announced things and what he did and the way that he was treating the black employees, they sent him to sensitivity training. He refused to go. Mm -hmm. They told him if he didn't go, then he would be dismissed. He refused to go and he was dismissed. So that goes to show you how deep it was embedded in certain people, no matter what the change is, even with their jobs, they wasn't going to bow down to right. equality. Right. Okay. Uh, I, let's give um, Lonnie, Andrew, and Mike a chance to maybe chime in with a few of their experiences and things that they observed at the point uh, over their tenures. Um, Mike, I see you um, You signed on. I, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about um, your family's history and your experiences on the point with respect to both this kind of personal racial animus and also kind of the more systemic issues. And then we'll go to, to Andrew and, and Lonnie, if he's here. Are you there, Mike? Well, maybe let's go to Andrew and then Mike All can right. come back in on. <laughs> You know, I, I started at Bethlehem Steel in June of 1970 in the blast furnace department. And at the time that I was hired, there were 110 of us. Uh, four out of the 110 were white. They were taken out and they were sent to the finishing side. Now, I didn't know anything about 
steel side, finishing side at all. I started in Oscar Hall's labor gang and the labor gang was a feeder unit to the blast furnace department. One of the first people that I met from the union at that time was Ivory Dennis. And at that time he was a zone man. Uh, he introduced me to all the union representatives. During that time period, I did not know that you had to have 420 hours before you actually was uh, involved in the union, the union could represent you. And he explained all of that to us. He told us to make sure that we did everything that we were supposed to do, stay on our jobs, do not um, uh, do anything contrary because I did not know not only was the labor gang a feeder unit, but it was a unit to weed out the undesirables as they called it. A foreman, a salary foreman could walk up in, and if he didn't like you or if you wasn't on the job, if you wasn't doing a certain thing the way he wanted to do it, he could fire you. You weren't represented by the union at that time. It was nothing to be said. So once we got our 420 hours, and we started getting introduced to Ivory Dennis, McCall White, Mace Lewis, and uh, Paschel Page. Those were the union representatives at that time. They started explaining to us how things function. They had just started taking the signs completely down out of the bathhouses of white hair, colored hair. Um, in fact, uh, one of the some of the one of the first jobs that I had was number five bathhouse going in to paint it and take the old signs that were still there down and carry them to the labor shannon so they can discard them. During that time period after that, about a month later, we were put on the blast furnace. Now, one of the things that I did not notice uh, at that time, uh, discrimination wasn't blatant as it was in the 50s and 60s, because 90% of the people on the blast furnace were black. Your foremans were black. Where the discrimination came in is that the management looked at the people that worked on the blast furnace as more or less um, individuals to be used and abused to, to create the steel out, to get it out. The salary positions at that time were occupied by mostly white, but the black foreman on the blast furnace, uh, they were the ones that ran the furnace. The keepers was one of the top jobs on the, on the blast furnace and that was all occupied by blacks. There were only six whites working in blast furnace operations at that time. And I worked with all of them and shared, shared food with them, um, cried with them, and hurt with them. Well, as time went on, in 1974, Ivory Dennis Mace Lewis, along with uh, Ed Barty Sr. and Don Kellner and them, they worked together under the consent decree to help bring that to the point. When the consent decree came in, women were allowed on the blast furnace. Uh, labor relations came in, OSHA came in. Working conditions improved tremendously because of that. Now, a lot of the women faced discrimination because the men didn't feel like women were, should be allowed to work on the blast furnace. But in actuality, when the women came into play, that made things better. Also in 1974, they started hiring more whites on the blast furnace. The Jim Blankenships, the Chromes, the, uh, they came into play. Once that changed, the attitude of the furnace started changing. But we still had a problem as far as promoting, but that affected not only blacks, it affected whites also. Then L Furnace came into play in 1978. In 1978, um, management wanted to put all college people on L Furnace. Ivory Dennis was, was the president of 2610 at that time. Once Ivory Dennis, uh, he negotiated with the management with him and McCall White and Mace Lewis 
they fixed it so the senior guys from the old side, which was A through one through eight furnace, could go to L furnace. Management wanted to have an ex extensive test in order just to get on L furnace. Well, Ivory and the rest of the union representatives fought against that and they finally won their case. And they moved the senior men over on L furnace and in turn, we moved up on the senior positions on old furnaces. Now, one of the things that I, I, I um, disagree with Ivory and, and, and a lot of the union officials is that you had two large locals, 2610 and 2609. They embedded ingre into us that 2610 didn't associate with 2609 mm -hmm. because that was a primary white local. Mm -hmm. I always questioned why do you need two locals if you're supposed to be representing the men, the constituents, the men and women. Well, we're not going to give up, give up our positions and they're not going to give up their positions. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it was done. And that's what was explained to us. So I didn't know, I didn't know anything about 2609. I had never stepped in to 2609 Union Hall in, until the 80s. Maybe we should explain to our listeners that 2609 represented the finishing mill workers, primarily, but not exclusively white workers, and 2610 represented the steel side workers, correct? Pre yeah. Mostly black, but not exclusively black. Well, what it was, was the steel side uh, that 2610 represented, represented the beginning processes of making steel. Yes. The, the finishing side or the primary side, it was called, represented the, uh, the end, end product of the steel and the product that was going out to the customer. And what was now, the racial ratio in both of those? And uh, on steel side, the Coke ovens, the BOF, the blast furnace, the centering plant, 90% of the jobs were occupied by Black. Mm -hmm. Over on the primary side or the finishing side, 70 to 80% of the jobs were white. Right. So right. that was the difference. Those were the craft jobs on that side. Right. So there was a certain amount of, how would you characterize the relationship between the 2609 and 2610 chapters of the steelworkers? Well, at that time period, before I transferred over to 2609, we didn't associate with 2609. Mm. We were told they have their they have their own union officials, their own bylaws, mm. and that was a stigma. That, and that's something that I had always questioned. Right. Although, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Eddie Barty wasn't your dad the first black president of 2609? Am I correct about that? Yes. Maybe yeah. Eddie can. Yeah. Yeah, weigh in yeah. a little bit about your dad's experience of being becoming president and long time president of what was a, a mostly white um, union local. Well, that that's true. What you're speaking about. My dad uh, became vice president in 1962. In 1962, up until 1996, he was uh, between president and vice president. He was president three different terms. I actually experienced um, my dad on the union floor at the time when folks were uh, eliminating jobs, it was called LOPT, the Green Book, when things were really rough, and this was in the eighties, and they were accommodating jobs, eliminating jobs, and it was the maintenance guys that uh, attacked him one day on the floor and once he came off the stage and said, why, you know, they personally said, why are you doing this? And he explained to them, it wasn't him personally doing it, it was the company. The company was always through attrition and through automation downsizing. The uh, products of, I mean, the people as far as uh, hourly employees. So the union always had a uphill fight to continue to keep things going when modernization was coming in. So basically, I know for a fact, even when I was a kid, that uh, my dad used to, while I was living on Spurs Point, he used to have a podium over at the basketball court where 
he had guys come down from the internet and they would actually, because of the community and so many guys work there, they would actually have rallies for equality is what you're saying, equality, equality on and on about the discriminatory practices. Just like I heard you speak before, my dad was a part of the statesman and uh, part of that was all the way up north, Indiana still, Chicago still and so forth. And all these guys came together to actually form and fight discrimination. I also looked at something when we looked at the, um, the, the, the international as a whole. And one of the things I looked at by, you know, getting involved a little with the international, when the time came, they had to fight to get a black person on the executive board and in the national. And they got, uh, Mr. Leon Lynch was the first black vice president. But to show you how things are, they had two vice presidents. They had one that was an administrator and they had one for human rights. And of course the black was for human rights. So if the president became absent, the first white president would step in place. It's, and I think it's that way, and Mike can answer that, I think it's still that way today with two vice presidents. And there's always a point of another stigma of discrim racial discrimination just within the international. Yeah, so okay. when, you, when you say that as a whole, I, I, I know the struggles and the, the things my father went through going to Washington, D.C. and going out of Annapolis. Even when I was laid off in 1983, I used to get on the bus and go to uh, D.C. with him and go over to Annapolis with him to fill into the, to the um, Justice Department to fight. Always right. a fight. Fight, fight, fight. Always and a fight. And that started so, really in the post-World -War, War II era, right? In the 1950s, all the way through um, to your own time at the point. 2012. Right? 2012, You, no matter how you looked at it, things were better. I'm not going to sit there and downplay like we didn't have uh, a greater opportunities. We had guys that were forming. We had uh, throughout the plant. We had guys that were operators. We had guys that were rollers. We had uh, people in electronics and mechanics and so forth. Uh, everybody was making a good wage. So, but you still had, like I was explaining to you earlier, somebody that still had the, I just called the good old boy club, which was half, halfway managers, okay? Yeah. That would deny people promotions and would hold people back. Right, so I'm even just, after the systemic obstacles had been kind of taken away, there were still those individuals who oh, did oh, whatever yeah, okay. they can to. I, I'm, I'll give you one real quick and I'm going to let you go because I know you got other people. In the 10 mill, we had three different occasions with hangman nooses, okay, from 1995 going forward. So when they hard in 95, they had what I call yippies that come in that got hard, okay? Now, uh, a personal friend of mine, he was the operator on the 10 mill housing line. Mm -hmm. When the sheet tore off, in order to connect the sheet back again, the guys on top was two white employees. He was down on the bottom. When they sent the rope down, it was in the form of a hangman's noose to connect to the sheet. Oof. Okay. Now, when, when, when we went to labor relations at that particular time, and we sit down and discuss these issues, um, it was really kind of sour because of the fact that at that time, the person that was on the Joint Civil Rights Committee was also the chief of police. To me, I'm gonna tell you what he did, he whitewashed it. He, he said, well, I don't know which one did it. And I'm like, BS. We had to go to Baltimore County Police Department because again, this is a federal law when you, when you do things that are discriminatory of this nature. Sure. We had to go to Baltimore County to get sensitivity training for the whole 10 mil production side. We had meeting after meeting to explain to them exactly when, um, Exactly. The union could not protect you if you got caught up in the situation throughout the plant. And they put a task force together, which was plainclothes police officers. So we explained to them, whatever you may be doing in the plant, you better watch what you're doing at this time. And we had um, uh, meetings, daylight, 3 to 11, 11 to 7, on every turn to explain to these people and things subsided. But this is, this is like I say, three different times it was hanging with nooses throughout the 10 mil. Shocking, so that gives you, shocking. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks so, for those yeah. sharing those stories with us. Yeah. Um, I see that Mike is now able to get on. Mike, uh, do you want to offer some um, um, thoughts on what we've been discussing so far? You mute. You mute. Maybe I need to Mike. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Thanks for joining. I, I was having a few technical difficulties here anyway. 
<laughs> I, I, I live out on the outskirts and we had a few, some snow down here. They're not used to it. And uh, I was having my internet fade in and out, but it's, I'm glad to be a part of this. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, I want to go back to something on the end uh, that Eddie was talking about with the International Union. And I, I'm proud to say now that uh, we now have a female African-American international vice president, young lady, a brilliant young lady by the name of Roxanne Brown, who is now uh, the vice president of administration. And we have a, also the other vice president is also an African-American by the name of Fred Redman, who will be leaving the organization. And Fred is now the secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO, which makes him the highest ranking African-American labor leader in the country uh, because the, the secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO was second to the president, who I'm happy to say is a female, Miss Liz Shuler. So, so we, we are making well, progress. Progress. Thank you. progress is being made and we have uh, another uh, female uh, on our executive board who's head of our paper industry, Ms. Leanne Foster. So I, it's, it's being chipped away slowly, but slowly, but surely. And they're coming on at a, at a relatively young age. So they have time in their careers to make a, uh, a significant impact on the labor movement. Mm. But, but back to the discussion of, of, uh, of Sparrow's point, I, I came in uh, February of 79. Uh, a lot of the heavy lifting was done by then by people like Eddie Barty Sr., uh, the Burt Dixons, and a lot of other people who uh, you know, put up with things uh, during their era that made it easier for me to it, it advance somewhat. But make no mistake about it, there was always a lot of subtle favoritism, cronyism, you know, in some cases, bl blatant nepotism, you know, at the plant that, that went on up until its unfortunate demise. Mm. You, know, you would see little things, you know, uh, you would see them hide overtime sometime for a favorite on a holiday. You would, wait everybody out and you find out about it the the, the next day or two days later and they saw oh, us this came up at the last minute you know and, and a little little crap like that you know yeah. that, that continued yeah. throughout the process but it, it's really what we went through down there was really kind of systemic of what's happening in 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 society right you know uh it, so and, it reflected and, that reality rather than being any different from what was happening in the rest of the country at that time. Absolutely, Deborah. And, and what really brought it to the forefront to me was the behavior. And everybody was upset about our plant closing. Oh, I apologize for that. Everybody was upset about our plant closing. But what that did through social media outlets was brought out uh, just pure raw emotion in some folks. And then some folks felt sort of liberated to express, you know, how they may have really felt all along. And, and it played itself out and it went all the way up into the 2016 presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we, we saw a lot of people who we worked around expose their true colors. They were able to mask it somewhat in the workplace, but over a period of time and even post-mortem to Sparrow's point, uh, you, you saw uh, bigotry rears ugly head. Right. But, right. but in, in the plant, you know, uh, uh, what saved us from even more overt racism was just the seniority system. You know, without the seniority system, you know, I can only imagine what it would have been like, you know, and you would always, right. you would always hear some younger employees coming in, like Eddie was talking about that, that 95 group who came in and, and they uh, were young and, you know, they didn't see the need for the, for all of the things the union had done. They thought it was just that the benefits that they enjoyed 
were just part of the landscape. They had no clue uh, of the struggle and the sacrifice and the battles that took place to get those wages and benefits, you know? Right. Yeah. Totally yes. Granted. Um, I'm wondering if now we could invite um, Bill Barry, who's a historian and who has also interviewed literally hundreds of uh, Sparrows Point employees over uh, the past decade to provide a little bit of context for these stories that we've been hearing, Bill. Well, it's a tough act to follow uh, with uh, Parti and Andrew, but uh, let me do my best here. Um, you really have to think of the history of Sparrows Point, I think, in terms of uh, what I call two migrations and three movements. And the first migration was really something that we heard a little bit about in uh, Mark Reuter's tape. Um, the original black workers coming up into work at what was then Maryland Steel. Um, and, and the company made a real conscious effort and they were a company which really understood control of the workforce. And that's why they built the town the way they did so that you lived in the town of Sparrows Point, you were not only working at the company, but you were living in one of their houses, you were shopping at their store, you were going to their doctors, and they had total power over you. About 85% of the black workers in the early years for the First World War were from the South. And they, as Mark described, came up as uh, non unskilled laborers picking a shovel gang, about 30% of them were estimated to be illiterate. And so they became a huge force within the, the uh, workforce. Um, the second migration was really at the time of the Second World War, when enormous numbers of workers came from the South into Northern cities. Um, Baltimore was estimated that the population, the black population tripled during this period. Went from about 85,000 in uh, 1910 to about 420,000 by 1970, an enormous increase. These are people leaving the deep South. I would mention on the side that one of the families that came in 1940 was a man named Day Lax, who came from a rural town in Virginia and once he and his brother started working at Sparrows Point, they acquired some money and they were able to bring up their spouses. And Henrietta Lacks came, they took a house at what became the black community, which was Turner Station. And that house has now got a historical marker on it and it's, it's a well-known place. So the movement, the first movement was really the Congress of Industrial Organizations, or the CIO, because it was formed in 1935 by unions which thought that industrial unionism was the way that the workers needed to organize. And industrial unionism means that everybody with a common employer is in the same union. They're not in a craft union like the plumbers or the carpenters or the airline pilots, but they're in a union like the steel workers or the auto workers. And what was important is that the leader of the CIO, John L. Lewis, was from a union, the mine workers, which was the first union that had in its constitution in 1890, a non-discrimination clause. And many of the unions coming up into the 20th century, even into the 1930s and 40s, and some as long as the 1970s, had white only restrictions. And that was formal. Many of the unions had white only as a custom. That is, they were father-son unions or father-daughter unions. And so if I'm in it, my son can come in it. And if I'm white, obviously he's gonna be white and it's gonna perpetuate. But one of the things that John L. Lewis did when he founded the CIO was to target organizing the steel industry. And he had to do that because his union, the mine workers, were being threatened by the steel companies and the steel companies owned the, owned the coal mines and a house divided cannot survive. And so the mines were all organized, but the steel mills were not. And so Lewis said, we've got to go get it. So one of the things that he did was to establish a steel workers organizing committee 
Uh, they opened an office here in Baltimore. 1937, they had their first rally uh, in East Baltimore at a Monument and Eden Street. One of the featured speakers was a guy who was then relatively unknown, a lawyer for the uh, NAACP called Thurgood Marshall. And he came and he uh, spoke. By 1937, then they had acquired contracts at different companies, places like Bethlehem Steel fought it. But by 1940, the campaign expanded. And at that point, it was a real different environment because the war was coming and defense contracts were huge. And Sparrow Point was one of the beneficiaries of that. So they then began to establish a program at Sparrow's Point targeting the 7,500 black workers who worked in Sparrow's Point. And the guy who's seen, if you ever see the video, Struggles in Steel, a legendary guy named Charles Parrish was one of the first black steel workers to uh, join. His son, Bernie Parrish, later got a, worked in the mill, got a job as a staff rep. I met his granddaughter once uh, on a tour. She was a clerk or helper at the New Shiloh Baptist Church, which is on the road from the plant over into Edgemere, the Black uh, Baptist Church, Heber Brown is the minister over there. But they started having meetings, large meetings. They had one at the steelworkers' offices in 1941. Charles Parrish got up and talked about racism and how important it was. One of the movements that what started the civil rights movement was Philip Randolph. And Philip Randolph came out of an all black union, the sleeping car porters, and began to organize through the NAACP. But in early 1940, he went to the president of the United States and said, all these defense plants are segregated and we want to see an end to that. And how many people do I have to bring to Washington to change your mind? 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. And so Franklin D. Roosevelt, the president at that time, very sophisticated political guy thinking I'm headed for an election in 1940, a hotly contested election. I don't need a big demonstration in Washington. And so he then passed, um, he promised Randolph that he would take care of it. And in June of 1941, he passed a executive order 8802, which prohibited discrimination in the defense industry on the basis of race, color, or national origin. And that was the first time that the federal government had said, we're not gonna have any more of this. The other thing that happened was, again, the government stepped in. They had been having hearings through the National Labor Relations Board about Bethlehem Steel's treatment of the union and discrimination and firing people and things like that. And there was a policy then and that if you were in violation of a federal law, you could not bid on a federal contract. And for Bethlehem Steel, that was absolutely catastrophic because they anticipated and realized enormous work and enormous profits even before Pearl Harbor. That is a and wasn't program. that also true during the Vietnam War, Bill, to yeah. jump forward a, a little, that yeah. much of what was able to be achieved in terms of yeah. civil rights at the point was completely linked to Bethlehem Steel's yep. I'm going to get to that. desire for defense contracts. I'm just, I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm just looking at our time because I know that some of our um, audience members might want to ask questions. So maybe audience, you can start typing in questions as Bill. Yeah, can- I'd be happy to do it. I mean, I would only, yeah. uh, as I said, whenever I do a program like this, I always tell people, bring your sleeping bags. No- <laughs> also, we <laughs> want to hear again from Andrew, Eddie, and Mike. All right. Continue, well, let me go continue. through then. The key, but I think the key part is that it, the, the government then pressured the Bethlehem Steel to agree to a union election. And this was a real key part in 1941 in September, uh, about almost 12,000 steel workers voted, uh, almost 70% of them voted for the steel workers. What then started was a huge movement. Charles Parrish is one of the first grievance and I'll, I'll skip a lot of these details. But the second move, so this was really the first movement, was organizing the union and getting it. Um, the second movement was people like 
Midagos who came back from the Second World War. And if you look in the book that I have, the interview with Lee Douglas, he basically said, I went to war and I was shot at. And I saw people killed and I killed people and I wasn't going to come back to those segregated bathrooms. And I know in the interview I did with uh, Eddie Barty's father, he said the same thing. He said, I'm not going to, we're not going to do it. So they came into the plant with a whole different attitude. And in the 19. Uh, 50s started protesting and started demanding a changes in segregation. A big part of this was in 1965, a man named I.W. Abel was elected president of the steelworkers. And he was a guy who had spoken in several years before that at an NAACP convention and had founded a steelworkers civil rights group. So it was a real, real difference at the top of the union. Lee Douglas, as uh, Eddie said, formed the New Statesman. They had started having meetings. They then, the third movement was really the civil rights movement after 1964. They had a federal law. They had all kinds of activities. They had meetings. There was a white backlash. But eventually, uh, they end up with the consent decree. And what that did was to eliminate unit seniority. Because prior to that, you were in the unit where you got hired for your whole life. And when the company made a policy of hiring only blacks into the unskilled, into the Coke ovens and things like that, that's where you were stuck. We've had previous programs, a guy, Phil Pack, that many of the people knew. He was one of the first guys from Turner Station to go to what was then an integrated Dundalk High School. And in 1967, the company came around and they did every spring to recruit guys to go to work in the skilled trades. And as long as Dundalk High School was segregated, they were only going to get white guys in the skilled trades. And so the first year that he was Bill was there, he was the first black student who agreed to be trained, became the first black skilled trades guy. And so it was a, a combination of workers' activities. And I think, let me finish by saying one of the stereotypes, it's really unfortunate, is that it was a white versus black, and it wasn't, because from the time before the union was started, there were white workers who supported the rights of blacks to be treated equally. And the steel workers' representatives, local presidents, district presidents, going back to Charles Parrish's grievances, represented him and continued to represent him. Um, there were also some black workers who unfortunately were content with what they were making and said, well, I'm not going to create problems. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to make a good living for my family. Things are, I'm not going to rock the boat. So it was a great history. The great comments that people have here about their experiences within that um, really express this. Well, as thank you for that, Bill, sure. um, for that history. Um, and in a way, you guys, panelists, Mike, Eddie, Eddie Jr. <laughs> um, and you guys were the inheritors of this long struggle, but uh, uh, Andrew, as each of you have, have made clear, despite you know that nearly near century of civil rights activism, um, still, still massive challenges that, that you face in the workplace. And now, of course, we find ourselves in a, a even worse environment in many ways, where many of the things that the Steelworkers Union fought for, where many of the things that the, the civil rights activists fought for on the point have completely somewhat dis dissipated. And we're back almost to where we were, you know, before all of this activism, where we see white workers and black workers and Hispanic workers being pitted against each other in order to allow companies to get away with some of the, you know, the same sorts of things that they were doing uh, 150 years ago. So where has the, the um, shuttering of Sparrows Point and, uh, and the, the union locals left, left you guys and your families, but also let's say black Baltimore in general, because of those high paying union jobs that you guys benefited from, despite the challenges on the point are many of them now gone, not only in steel, but also in the auto industries and elsewhere. 
So where, what do we need to do now, Andrew Morton, to kind of continue the progress that has sputtered but never entirely died? You know, uh, let me say this. One of the best things that uh, the union and the company ever negotiated was when the uh, ISG took over and the company and the union negotiated career development. Career development opened up the area colleges for, uh, for all of us to go and get new enhanced skills. I got my computer skills through that program. Also, people like Mike Lewis, Ruta Seal, Ed Barty Jr., they should be given a, a, a big uh, pat on the back also because Mike Lewis was very instrumental in working and, and talking to people about getting re-educated and more skills. Even when the plant went down, Mike Lewis was right there for us when we were enrolling in the colleges and so forth. Not one time did I ever go up to that hall and it was shutting it down then and Mike Lewis was there that he did not help me, help me get into the schools. If I needed paperwork and so forth, he was there for me. Now I can't say that about every union official, no. But those type of guys need to deserve a pat on the back. Ed Barty Jr. is the one that encouraged me along with Bill Burry, to get my computer skills and the assets that I've created for Bethlehem Steel out there so the rest of the world could see. Um, without career development, without the things that the, the union set up and fought for, I would not have been able to accomplish the things that I did. Now, in 1990s, in the, in the late 90s, uh, there was a, in a hot mill, I transferred over to 26, so now I was in the hot mill then. There was a zone man by the name of Alfonso McNeil. I fought him tooth and nail on some of the practices because I felt as if the practices were outdated and the training in the hot mill was horrible. We went round and round and then he was getting ready to retire and I ran for his position as zone man. Now I lost the position to a guy by the name of Donahue. The reason I lost because I wanted to make changes. I've always felt as if that companies and unions have to work for the betterment of their constituents to put out a better product. And what that means is, is that you have to have more skills in today's time with the technology that's there. That was one of the things that I pushed in the hot mill. When I was able to go to the college and learn programming skills and computer skills, I came back and put it into the mill. Now, not only did I have help from people like Mike Lewis, Jerry Ernest, and, and those guys, but I had help from the white engineers. and Everybody contributed together. So that was a case where management and union was working together to produce a better skilled employee to put out a better product. When I brought my software, when I, when I created my software um, that the company brought, I went to the union. Now, the young union leadership at that time knew what I was doing and accepted, like Mike Lewis has accepted it fully. But the older union leadership was still hung up into what happened in the 60s and 70s and the way things were. They were not willing to advance. Right. And that was the most important thing. So it sounds like what I'm hearing from you, Andrew, is more opportunities for education and training and people should be encouraged to take advantage of those opportunities. And that could help get us to the next, the next that, level. That's not going to help. It will get us to the next because yeah, it will get us to the next level is advancing. And yeah. if you don't have the skilled labor force to match that advancement, you become stagnant. Yes. And if you become stagnant, you go nowhere. That's when your economy starts faltering. Mm. 
That is so wise. So wise. Can we let Eddie have a chance to answer the question and then circle back around? Yeah. Dad, one of the things that was definitely a good scenario, even though the state, when the plant shut down, we had the, the career center was at East Point. And a lot of the people went to all state and they had medical, medical records, nursing, dental, uh, CDLs, electrical. Uh, I actually went there myself. I had CDLs in the past. I used to drive a tractor trailer and then I kind of lost them and became financial secretary and moving forward. But the long story short, I went back just in case I would need them because they were offering it because we were unemployed steel workers. The state was paying for us. I wanted to take advantage of that situation. Just like Andrew said, you know, you have the computers, anything that you possibly wanted to do, all you had to do was pass your class and the state would pay for it. So the younger workforce had to look at this situation and say, hey, I don't have the job that I had prior to. So I look at the guys now that are working for Amtrak, working for BG&E, working for uh, Amazon. Some of these guys, man, came from out of the steel industry and some of these guys have got back on their feet. Some of these people have started their own companies and things of that capacity. So just by going to school at Allstate and any other career development that was out there that the state provided really helped our workforce to move forward. I mean, recognizing the fact that the plant now has been shut down since 2012 and we are currently in 2022. So... When you look at the workforce that was senior enough to be able to retire and get what was deserved to them with their pensions and their social security to move forward. But you also have to look at that particular time, I was 57. Uh, I had to look at something because I always was the breadwinner and the one that carried the healthcare benefits. So I, I, I went back to work with Baltimore County Public School to, to protect myself to, to move forward and, and uh, just got involved with their union too as well. But when I say that, Um, that was a good thing that the state took upon the unemployed steel workers to move them forward so they could put themselves in position to move forward to where they are today. So we also need federal involvement and federal policies that will help the workers access this new education and training and find those new opportunities. That's what I'm I'm hearing you say, Eddie. Mike. this, this, This is what took place in 2012 and 2013. Right. People had the opportunity to go back at that particular time to be educated on different things. Like I told you, I know some that went for medical. I know some went to for the den- dentistry assistants. I know one right. x-ray technicians and so forth. Some went on the other side. Some went for the yeah. CDLs. Some went for uh, um, the electrical, the uh, HAZVAC. All these things were there and gave them opportunity to move forward with a, a skilled job. Right. Gotcha. Mike, do you want to um, offer some su- suggestions of how we get to the next phase of these movements and histories that Bill laid out for us? Mike, are you there? Mike, Mike gone. M- mute. Unmute. <laughs> Thank Mike gone. Oh, he's gone. Okay. Yeah. Well, before we wind up, I want to read um, a comment that was offered by uh, Len Chindel. Len is a, a white steel worker who came on at Sparrows Point in the 1970s and who, um, as a, a union um, officer, shop steward, um, I don't know if he was ever a zone man, but anyway, was very much involved with in supporting the civil rights struggle. And Len says, I would like to honor the history of the black workers who led the fight against discrimination and occupational hazards in the Coke ovens. Their struggle that led to demonstrations on a wildcat strike was joined by a wide coalition of the workforce, including newly hired black and white Vietnam veterans. Black and white workers who were part of the anti-war movement and the civil rights and black liberation movements, veteran black and white trade unionists, women who were now filling jobs that were formally denied to them, the struggle had national and international attention and left a powerful legacy. And I think Len's comment is really important in showing another piece of this puzzle and how we advance and that solidarity. Because as long as we are allowing ourselves to be kind of fractured into warring factions, 
we get nowhere, right? It yeah, takes absolutely. kind of solidarity and recognizing our mutual interests, our shared interests uh, in order for us to, to continue moving forward. And I think all of, Bill, you'd like to comment? Well, I would like to say, looking at the history, I think one of the things that is very, very important today, and it's kind of been a discussion here, is people are expecting the government to come in and bail us out. And what got the steelworkers at Spiros Point, black and white, where they are, where they were, is because they organized. And they took it on themselves to reach out and to take the time and the effort and the risks to make things happen. And if there's a lesson today, that's what we have to do. I hear so many people saying, well, the government's got to come in and do this, blah, blah, blah. No, we got to do stuff for ourselves. And one of the things that we've seen in the past in other areas, what's a, in the homestead, particularly steel workers actually tried to talk about taking over the steel mill. And they talked about trying to finance it and operating it as a worker-owned co-op. And I think that was never a discussion at Spiros Point, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but it was always, and the anger that people talked about, the political anger, uh, Deborah, that you mentioned, and that um, one else mentioned since 2012 uh, is a reflection of that. Mm -hmm. It's a reflection mm -hmm. of a, a two or three generations since the New Deal of people saying, well, the government's going to take care of everything. Well, but it also, yeah. I ah. think, is as uh, I think uh, Mike pointed out, maybe that anger had been there simmering all along. It was. <laughs> and then they felt like it could be given expression. Uh, well, I think the, the anger that I saw was people saying, oh, Kevin Kamenet should have done something or Martin right. O'Malley should have done something. It was always right. someone else should have done something. Right. And That's, yeah. I'm going to just sit here and, and let them do it. And I think that was a problem in many cases, Eddie and Andrew and Mike and other could say, with a union that a lot of people who were working there figure, well, I'll just pay my dues and somebody else will take the responsibility. So we have like five more minutes. I don't see right. any okay. audience questions. Um, uh, being on my reps, do we have any questions that need to be answered? And I also see that Len Shindell has a mic now and Len, maybe you might want to offer some summing up comments about what you observed in your years at the point. Well, it's a, it's it's an honor to, to be on the you know to be here at all and I and I um, respect uh, the discussion very much I you know I think um, in my time uh, as a representative one of the the absurdities of white supremacy became very clear when after the consent decree um, a predominantly white high paying unit had young white workers who were basically working operator positions. And the company took the position that rather than elevate and promote workers from the other side of the plant um, who had lost their jobs through technology, uh, black and white, but predominantly black, I believe, with a lot of seniority, they would end up paying uh, them not to promote. So they were paying two people <laughs> for, mm -hmm years at a time to do the highest job on the mill until it, it, until it blew up. So um, I think um, looking back, there's been some deficiencies on our part in promoting why, um, looking out for each other, why an injury to one is an injury to all. And we've lost opportunities to show that because more white workers benefited from the consent decree than black workers. And we were deficient in not taking that lesson out to the community at large, to the schools, mm -hmm. that this is why we have to fight um, all forms of oppression, exploitation, and racism, because it hurts everybody. And because we can all benefit when we have a successful fight against it. So um, honored to be here and uh, great discussion. And it could go on, like Bill said, for hours. Yeah, and that's hours. true. <laughs> It's hard to say this is the end because I'm sure we'd all like to, to keep talking. Well, um, thank you to the BMI for organizing this great discussion. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Eddie. Um, thank you, Mike, who was here briefly. Um, and hopefully 
we'll be able to um, continue this discussion at some future at some future point. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I just want to remind you there is um, a link to a survey in our chat, and this program will be posted on YouTube. So if you want to share um, the recording with someone who couldn't be here, please um, look for that. Feel free to send that um, to them. And just one last, uh, yeah, thank you. And I hope you'll consider supporting the BMI so we can continue to do this kind of program um, and serve as a community resource um, moving forward. So thank you so much. Really appreciate everyone's time this afternoon. Thank you, man. All right, there. All right, there. See you later, Barty. Take care. See you when Take you get care, back everybody. <laughs> All right.